Hey, Robert, looking forward to your talk, man. Thank you. Excited to present. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cardiology uh, Rounds. Uh, this morning we have Dr. Uh, Robert Avram. He is one of our interventional cardiology fellows. Um, he completed his internal medicine and cardiology training at the University of Montreal and then uh, went to uh, UCSF in San Francisco uh, to pursue a fellowship in artificial intelligence and interventional cardiology. Um, while there, he worked on developing and implementing uh, various digital tools into uh, large-scale pr uh, prospective uh, health studies. Um, he's also a self-taught programmer um, and uh, has expertise in clinical research by applying uh, machine-based learning. So he's currently with us at UOHI completing his Interventional Cardiology Fellowship um, with a plan to complete uh, his training this June. Um, following that, he will be joining the uh, Montreal Heart Institute uh, as part of their faculty. So we welcome him this morning. Um, the topic uh, of his presentation is uh, applications of artificial intelligence and cardiology. So welcome, uh, Robert, and we look forward to your presentation this morning. Thank you for the introductions, uh, Dr. Stadnik, and I'm honored to be here and to be presenting in front of such a distinguished crowd. We'll be diving to the depths of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, also known as AI and cardiology, very shortly. And I'm super excited to be talking to you about this topic, which uh, I'm really passionate about, and it's my main area of research and hopefully, you know, clinical practice in the future. Before we begin, um, I have to share my uh, disclosures. So as you can see, there is no disclosure that are in relationship with this uh, presentation. Otherwise, I had some research funding, which is in the lower right. My presentation today is divided in five sections. First, I want to convince you that you should pay attention to AI as a clinician, a cardiologist, a physician. Then I want to briefly introduce the topic of exactly what is AI and what do we mean by AI today in 2021. Then uh, this is the main part of the, the presentation. It's uh, concrete applications of AI and cardiology, uh, which are projects I was lucky to be involved in. And then we'll dive into the myths and limitation of AI, and then talk a little bit about uh, future application and future perspectives about where AI is going. So before we begin, why should you pay attention to artificial intelligence as a physician cardiologist? So I want to start my presentation by citing my favorite uh, real life superhero, uh, Elon Musk, and he tweeted and also said many times in interviews that we should be excited about the future. Uh, you need to have a reason to wake up in the morning. And he was referring to humans colonizing Mars and being a multi-planetary species. But I think similarly in medicine, a future where AI could free up time for physicians to focus on patients by automating a lot of the routine tasks that physicians perform daily uh, could ultimately make medicine more humane and patient-centric by allowing physicians to care for patients rather than you know, digest very complicated data uh, coming from multiple modalities. Also, I think a really exciting part about AI is that it can use pre-existing data to unleash a whole new array of applications that were previously impossible to achieve uh, using, uh, you know, classic medical training, and I'll try to convince you about the latter. Uh, but just let's stop, you know, dreaming for a, a minute, and why do we talk about AI today? So it's important to just look at two data points. First of all, computer power has been doubling uh, every two years. That's Moore's law uh, pre-2012, and you can see it here with the, I'm pointing it with my the laser. So it's been growing steadily, but since 2012, due to a shift in the way the processors are manufactured, computer power has been doubling every 3.4 months. And what was requiring extremely specialized expertise and very expensive computers now can be done with much more affordable uh, computers that uh, you know any medical center or really any person can afford. So that really made AI mainstream because anyone can uh, develop their own AI model today uh, be, due to the, the access to very strong computer power. And similarly, we have an explosion of digital data in medicine. So Ottawa Heart Institute and the Ottawa healthcare system was very lucky to be the first in Canada to have an epic end-to-end -end electronic medical record 
This allows for digital notes creation. Also labs were digital before that. Imaging is all digital and we're generating pentabytes of data on a yearly basis in medicine. And I uh, just want to let you know that data is essentially the oil powering the AI revolution. You need digital data to train AI algorithms. And this has also exploded in parallel with the computational power. But why specifically in medicine? So as you're aware, medicine is becoming more complex. We can just look at the diverse areas of research and fellowship available here at Ottawa Heart Institute and in cardiology. So we're all extremely specialized in our own field. Um, and every year there's new tools that are developed in genomics, in, in metabolomics and in you know computer science, making it even more complex. So we need to have a way to be efficient in digesting that data. And I think AI is the answer to that. It's also hard as a physician or human to make sense of all the data available. And we tend to summarize it with risk scores that are derived from a population and we try to apply it to a single patient. Um, also data interpretation needs standardization. So as I will show today, there's a lot of variability when you look at an ECG uh, from you know, two physicians or a coronary angiogram from two interventional cardiologists. And there's no standard uh, standardization available now or the standardization doesn't work really well outside of the clinical research setting. And finally, we need to move away from one size fits all towards personalized medicine. So I think uh, the argument I'm trying to make today is that AI could allow for more efficient, streamlined and standardized care that is tailored to the patient, so that it's individualized to the patient. And I think in the end, we'll make medicine more humane and patient centric. So before we go into applications of AI, I just want a, a brief introduction so you can understand a little bit how AI works. And in order to do so, um, I have to talk about the conventional statistics. This is by no means exhaustive, but conventional statistics assumes a predefined relationship between variables and usually requires, uh, you know, 30 examples or more of data points. So I'll start just with a classic example every cardiologist or physician is familiar with, which is a ST segment elevation. So we're taught in medical school that you look at the J point and if the J point is greater than one millimeter uh, of elevation compared to the TP segment, this is called uh, a STEMI, especially if you have reciprocal changes. So this is a rule-based system and you can put the elevation of the ST segment on a logistic curve that I plot here and basically figure out that one millimeter maybe is the optimal discrimination cutoff between a STEMI ECG from a not a STEMI ECG. And using this rule-based system, you apply it to all ECGs and that's how you diagnose a STEMI. AI works different. AI starts with the, the data and AI will learn by analyzing the relationship between the examples and the outcome on large amounts of data. We're talking usually 10,000 data points, but real world AI applications usually involve you know, billions of data points. Um, and instead of teaching an AI to look for the ST segment, you just show it normal ECGs and STEMI ECGs. And by seeing a lot of examples, it will figure out what is important in the ECG signal to predict the STEMI. And it could be the ST segment elevation. It could be other features that us as humans are not familiar with, or it could be a combination of both. And AI essentially learns from the data without any pre-specified relationship. So that's really important because in medicine, we like to understand the relationship between variables and we tend to simplify a lot of the, the risk scores to conventional statistics, but AI cannot really describe you that relationship. We'll just learn it on its own. This is a funnel of, AI application in cardiology, and I start with more general tasks and I go to more specific or more uh, highly specialized. So, you know, I will show today different levels of AI. And first of all, AI could perform very well-defined tasks that physicians currently perform, like reading an ECG. Also, AI is able to support underserved communities. For example, if you have a remote community with no access to ophthalmology care, you could imagine AI screening patients for ophthalmology pathologies or helping GPs interpret ECGs if there's no cardiology on place. Then AI is also really good at integrating multiple modalities. And I'm talking about EMR notes data with images, with lab results to improve, for example, risk prediction. Also, AI is able to make sense of data that we didn't use for a specific purpose as humans. So I'll show some examples in the future. And I just want to finish with general AI because you're, you're going to hear that term sometimes in the press or in the, the media. And general AI is really part of the realm of science fiction. Right now, we have narrow AI, which is really good at a single well-defined task. And there's no current path towards general AI. You don't need more data or more computer power to have 
uh, an AI that's able to make sense of all the world and perform multiple tasks on its own and have like a conscience, uh, there's no path towards that. And this is really on the realm of research and it's possible never able to achieve that with current computers or the way we develop technology. Now, AI in medicine has a complicated roadmap. So first it requires digital data generation. And as I just mentioned, we have achieved that step uh, in Ontario and Canada because we generate millions of digital data points using EMR scans and labs. Then you need to take that digital data and you need to train an AI algorithm. Normally you train it in house and then you also validate it in house on a holdout separate data set that's also developed in house to see how your AI model performs. But it's not enough to have AI in the real world. You usually need at least one or multiple external validations similar to clinical trials. You need to show that your AI algorithm is working outside of your institution. And then you need to find a way to integrate it into clinical workflow. This step is often underestimated because it's not enough to have an AI algorithm that can read ECGs. You have to display the result in a convenient manner. And ideally, you don't want to add more work to the physician. You want to make it as simple as possible. And this is mainly on the realm of research. And then you have to demonstrate that AI has positive impacts on outcomes. And I would say most of the AI algorithms today have achieved step one through five, but there's no outcomes tied to that showing that it improves anything in the care. But I think we're moving towards that goal. First, we wanted to show a proof of concept that this type of algorithm works and eventually we'll have the clinical trials showing that it could improve efficacy or you know, cardiovascular death or MACE. And also as a brief uh, introduction for those that are less familiar with epidemiology or um, the, you know, the statistical tests used to report the performance of AI classifiers, I just wanna you know, as a refresher, present to you the, the receiver operand curve. So basically you can see it here to the left, but the, we will use the area under receiving operand characteristic curve to determine the, the accuracy of an AI algorithm. The ROC curve is created by plotting the true positive rate against the false positive rate. And the true positive rate might not mean much, but it, it's actually the synonymous for sensitivity. And the false positive rate is one minus specificity. So you plot, you know, the specificity at different levels of sensitivity, and you get this curve and you're gonna measure the area under it to tell you how good the AI is at classifying, for example, an ECG into a STEMI and not a STEMI. If you look here, this is a random classifier and it has an area under the curve of 0.5. This mainly means that it's like flipping a coin. So it has not understood exactly what is the ECG. It will just output a random value like STEMI or not a STEMI in a 50% basis. Uh, so that's not a good classifier. Then you have, you know, error 0.6, which is better and moving away 0 0.7, 0 0.8. And this is a perfect classifier in the top left, uh, which is an AUC of one. Those don't exist in uh, nature. There's no such classifier that could identify 100% of the correct examples, 100% of the negative examples. There's always some error involved in it, including in AI algorithms. And then I also want to show you on the right, the confusion matrix. So confusion matrix is essentially a two by two grid that plots the true positive, false positive, false negative, true negatives. And you can use that as well to determine the sensitivity and specificity, that specific cutoff. And you want the AI algorithm to only output true positives and true negatives and have a minimal error rate. So this is how you present results. And all the results I'll present today will display confusion matrices and also the area under the receiver operand curve. So let's dive uh, deep into the applications of AI. And I'll start with the first project I was lucky to be involved in that also involves the Ottawa Heart Institute. It's called Cat AI. And we start with coronary artery disease. So CD is the number one cause of death in the US and the second cause of death in Canada. And as you're aware, coronary angiography is still the gold standard for diagnosis and also treatment of CAD. But as interventional cardiologists, and I, I suffer from that too, we usually use visual assessment of stenosis uh, as the de facto method for assessing the severity of, of uh, coronary stenosis. In short, we eyeball it. And this measurement, when we look at studies, suffers from high interobserver variability, ranging from 20 to 25%. This means you take two interventional cardiologists looking at the same stenosis in the same angiogram, and you're gonna get about a 20 to 25% difference on average in the narrowing. As you're aware, this has impo important clinical implications. For example, it might lead to inappropriate PCI or not enough stenting or inappropriate coronary artery bypass back. Graph. So in order to standardize this measurement, we wondered, can we develop an AI algorithm that can automatically read a coronary angiogram and localize stenosis and predict their severity? 
To do so, we took 13,000 patients that underwent the coronary angiogram in San Francisco between 2010 and 2019. We extracted the angiographic images, and we also took the percent synopsis of all the coronary segments as extracted from the coronary uh, angiography report. Then we trained four separate AI algorithms to perform different tasks for automatic coronary angiography reading, and we validated it in a subset of angiogram performing UCSF, and also in five angiograms performed at Odell Heart Institute between July and October 2020. This is an overview of CAPT AI. So like I said, it's four algorithms. The first one will look at the angiographic images and will determine the projection angle. So are you looking at the vessel in apicotal, areocranial, which view are you looking at? Then once it figures out the view, it will also try to determine the underlying anatomy structure. This is important because a lot of the angiographies can be of a femoral artery or of an LV gram or a root shot and an orthogram. So you really want to focus on predicting stenosis on coronary arteries and not other structures. And then once it finds the coronary artery, it will determine the anatomy, localize the stenosis, and once it localizes the stenosis, it will predict the percent of that stenosis. This is a video in the lower left showing the algorithm working in real time. So you can see it successfully determined the anatomy of this right coronary artery. And in yellow, you will see separate boxes that highlight the different stenosis. And you can see here a stenosis in the proximate RCA that's been highlighted in multiple frames. And then it excludes the back line and predicts, for example, here a 46.9% stenosis. So here are the results of our algorithms. Algorithm one were for, for the projector incident classification. This is a confusion matrix with different views. Again, you want to have them in this diagonal right here that I'm highlighting. And you can see the majority of our uh, predictions by the AI algorithm match the actual uh, you know, incidents or view, and we observe a 92% sensitivity and specificity in over 200,000 images. Then we also want to determine what is the underlying structure. And again, you can see the most important is left and right coronary. So the AI algorithm is really good at identifying those two. And our overall, our different classes like craft, uh, graft, uh, pigtail, ventriculography, the AI algorithm was also able to correctly identify those structures. Now, we all often describe AI as a black box but we use specific uh, algorithms here to highlight areas of the image that are used in predicting the different, for example, anatomical structures. So here we're looking at the left coronary artery, but what is the AI using to predict the left coronary artery? So you can see it highlighted here with a heat map and red means it's a stronger prediction, blue means it's a weak prediction for left coronary artery. And you can see it's mainly looking at the left coronary artery to predict the actual anatomic structure. This is really important because there's been cases in the past where AI was using metadata to predict a particular class rather than the actual you know, underlying structure. And you can see here the pixels that are used in the prediction. We've done the same exercise, for example, for the aortogram, and not surprisingly, it's using part of the aorta to predict that this is an aortogram. So that's, that's important to, to always double check that your AI algorithm is actually using the right data to predict your object of interest. Now, this is the most interesting slide, and it represents the stenosis percentage prediction by our classifier. So to the left, you see the receiver operand curve, and we looked at classifying a stenosis into greater than 70% and under 70%. So a severe stenosis from a non-severe stenosis. And you can see here, you have three curves. In green, you have the image level stenosis. So you look at a single frame in a video, and you have an area on the curve of 73, which is a, a mild to moderate level of accuracy. Then you move to the yellow, so you average all the frames in a video in a cine angiography, and you increase the area under the curve from 72 to 78. And then when you average the artery segment across multiple views, like we do as humans, we look at the stenosis in multiple views to determine the most severe, uh, the area under the curve increases to 84. And overall, we had about 76% sensitivity and 75% specificity. So on average, but keeping, it's an average performance, but keep in mind our gold standard here was visual assessment of stenosis, which also suffers from biases. We also looked at parts of the image that are used in predicting the level of stenosis. So keep in mind that here it's a fully automatic method. AI is just getting pictures of vessels and trying to predict the percentage. And you can see in the left column, the actual input to the network in the right column, what the network is, the, the AI algorithm is looking at to predict the stenosis severity. And it's mainly looking at the, the tightest area of the stenosis. Or in this case, you see it's looking at the whole vessel because the whole vessel looks diffusely diseased. 
Uh, we also validated the, the findings in an external validation data set. So we asked two interventional cardiology fellows from Ottawa Heart Institute to help us with 386 coronary angiograms. We're up to 500 now. And we asked them a simple question, which is what is the percentage of stenosis in the bounding box? You can see it here. There's a prox circumflex stenosis. And we compared their percentage stenosis with what AI was predicting. So first of all, the two adjudicators had on average a 14% difference in the stenosis percentage, and they disagreed in 15.8% of the cases. So um, that means in 15.8%, one said it was a severe stenosis and the other said it was a non-severe under 70%. This is the area under the curve as well, comparing the AI algorithm. In blue, you have AI against the first adjudicator. You have an area on the curve of 0.84. In yellow, you have an AI algorithm against the, adjudicator, the second adjudicator. You have, again, a 0.84 area under the curve. And when you take the average, of the two adjudicators and you compare it to the AI, you end up with an error on the curve of 0 0.86.5, uh, which basically means that AI performs better uh, when compared to the mean of two, uh, the average of two cardiologists rather than a single cardiologist. And again, this shows that if you take the collective wisdom, uh, if I may express myself this way, and you compare it to AI, it's, usually AI is gonna perform better because it represents really a, a distribution in the population of the assessment of stenosis percentage rather than the preference of a single operator. So the, my take home message for the CIS project is that we're able to successfully demonstrate for the first time that we can use AI to read coronary angiograms from start to finish, meaning we can determine the pro projection, the underlying anatomic structure, where are the stenoses, what's the anatomy and what's their level of severity. It works internally and both externally. And I think this is the important work because it sets the foundation for standardized stenosis measurement. And eventually, because you can automatically determine the anatomy, you can calculate the severity of the CAD using, for example, a digital syntax score. So we're working on that uh, at the moment. Next, I want to uh, introduce the, the topic of digital biomarkers. So this is a uh, a paper we published uh, last year about a digital biomarker for diabetes using a smartphone app. Um, so as you're aware, diabetes is a huge public health issue. It will affect almost 700 million people by 2045. And if you delay diagnosis, it has considerable implications on morbidity and mortality. So we need better tools to screen for diabetes or detect diabetes. And a lot of people, especially in developing countries, don't have access to routine testing. This is uh, an example of photoplatysmography. So this here is an iPhone app and any, any iPhone or wearable can determine photoplatysmography. It's an optical technique used to detect blood volume changes. It shines light on the pulp of your finger and the light gets reflected back by every, you know, blood, uh, every systolic contraction of the heart and that gets uh, converted to a signal. It's frequently used in Fitbit or Apple Watch to tell your heart rate, the new Apple Watch can tell you oxygen saturation. You also use it in the hospital for oxygen saturation, but it has never been used to detect uh, diabetes. So our research question here was, uh, we asked ourselves, can we detect diabetes using a photoplatysmography signal obtained using a smartphone app and analyze using an AI algorithm? To do so, we leveraged Healthy Heart. This is a San Francisco cohort. It's actually a worldwide cohort, but it's a San Francisco registry that invited anyone with an email address over the age of 18 to contribute data to, to, to research and to cardiology uh, research specifically. So we invited um, 54,000 participants to join the study to complete various surveys, including a medical questionnaire about their current diabetes status. And we also told them to record as many photoplatysmography measurements as they could so we obtained in total 2,600,000 measurements using this approach. And we haven't met any of those patients. This was all a remote study. We built an AI classifier that essentially outputs a digital diabetes score ranging between zero and 100. 100 being the you know, very high likelihood of diabetes, zero being no likelihood of diabetes. And we use that score to classify a photoplasmography signal into diabetes and non-diabetes. Our goal here was to develop a proof of concept uh, to see if this worked or not. So here again, you can see four different area under the curve, um, RSC curves. And first of all, if I start with the blue one, this is the performance of the AI classifier in classifying a single 20 second PPG recording obtained from a smartphone. And you see it has, uh, you know, weak performance and error on the curve of 68. Then if you average all the performances in an individual, you end up with an area under the curve of 76. So slightly better. And then here in green, we develop a logistic regression model 
that was used as a comparator. So we took age, gender, race, BMI, and comorbidities like hypertension and cholesterol in order to predict diabetes status in an individual. And here we had an area under the curve of 78.4, which is essentially almost all as good as averaging out the signals of PPG in an individual. But here's where it gets really interesting. You have the red curve where I took the logistic regression model and I combine it with the diabetes, the digital diabetes score. And you can see that's how you achieve the greatest performance of an error on the curve of 83, which is comparable to A1C for screening for diabetes or fasting plasma glucose is slightly higher, but it's comparable to the, the biological blood test used for diabetes. And we validated this finding in a contemporary cohort, that's basically 7,000 patients that had newer smartphones to show that the smartphone camera is not, you know, doesn't change the accuracy too much. And we also took 181 patients in the clinic that were undergoing diabetes screening. We took blood tests and we compare the, the digital diabetes score with the blood test. And overall, we found uh, sensitivities ranging between 75 and 84 percent, and specificities ranging between uh, 53 to 65 percent. So the, the AI algorithm is very sensitive. It's not that specific. It could be used for screening because of high sensitivity. Also, what's interesting is because we had blood work in some of our patients, we looked if the digital diabetes score was a predictor of HbA1c and fasting glucose. And uh, we were surprised to find that this was also a significant predictor of A1c and fasting glucose, meaning you could potentially estimate blood values using a digital diabetes biomarker. We also looked at parts of the signal highlighted here in pink that were used to predict diabetes status. And we found that uh, features like heart rate, heart rate variability, the wave morphology, the absence of a dichrotic notch were features that were used for diabetes. We also find that the presence of a dichrotic notch, uh, the upslope, the heart rate was also important for predicting non-diabetes status. So the take home message of this project is that we describe a digital biomarker in a large scale real world cohort for the prevalent status of diabetes. We can collect this biomarker using any uh, smartphone that has this flashlight and a camera. So it's potentially accessible to billions of people and it's an independent predictor of diabetes, A1C and fasting glucose. So I wanted to highlight this example because we never use PPG signals in the past to analyze signals for diabetes status. And this is an example of applying AI to develop new tools that us as humans are not you know, trained to do. Uh, and to, so that's really one of the major strengths of AI uh, rather than just replicating physicians work. And as next steps, we took, or we're taking here an FDA approved AI algorithm uh, called IPAX, which is basically a camera system that takes pictures of the retina. And then they developed a FDA approved algorithm that can tell you if you have diabetes retinopathy and what's the grading of the diabetic retinopathy. This is important because diabetes retinopathy is the gold standard for diagnosing diabetes. All the A1C or fasting glucose values are based on a level of diabetes retinopathy. And we'll compare that to our AI algorithm here uh, to see uh, which one uh, performs better. And to also see if we are able to screen for diabetes using an iPhone app based on the diabetic retinopathy standardization. So third, I want to uh, present to lead ECG interpretation with deep learning. So this is another project uh, I was uh, involved in that um, we developed in San Francisco that looks at interpreting 12 lead ECGs using AI. Right now, the largest studies looking at AI interpretation of ECGs only looked at halters in single lead ECGs and also suffer from limiting uh, potential diagnoses. So we ask ourselves, can we automate 12 lead ECG interpretation using AI? To do so, we took 300,000 patients, 400,000 ECGs, and each ECG read by the AI could have up to 43 possible diagnoses ranging from arrhythmias, cardiac chamber dilatation, conduction troubles, and ischemia. We also took 1,000 ECGs, and we had them overread by a panel of electrophysiologists who had to come to a consensus about the underlying diagnoses. And we also compared the performance of our AI algorithm with the gold standard adjudicated ECG by the electrophysiologists. So here is the first, the, the result. So this is the top ECG clinical diagnosis. You can see ma the majority of them were uh, sinus rhythm, but we also had a couple of them that um, um, were left ventricular hypertrophy or a right bundle branch block or AFib. And um, we then compared the performance and I wanna draw your attention 
uh, here in this column, which is the area under the curve for the different classes. So we observe a near perfect area under the curve of 0.97 to 0.99 for all rhythm disturbances uh, highlighted here. Then we looked at conduction disturbances. We also have an area under the curve of 0.99, which is near perfect uh, classification. Then we looked at chamber enlargement and we have uh, similar results. The only one that was a, a bit uh, lacking is ST segment elevation. You can see we only had 831 examples, so very few. Uh, for an AI perspective, and we had an error on the curve of 0.86. Also, when we look at lead misplacement, we have an error on the curve of 0.84, so not as well as we have expected. But the most interesting findings are in this table. We um, took the gold standard of a panel of electrophysiologists as the diagnosis of the ECG, and we compared three modalities. So the DNN F1 score here is the AI algorithm. DNN stands for deep neural network. Then we also have the cardiologist clinical interpretation. So each ECG is read by a cardiologist and put in the patient chart. So we compared this diagnosis with what the EP panel physicians uh, have found. And we also took the MUSE, which is the automatic read of the ECGs that you see in the top label when you're performing 12 lead ECG. And Overall, we had an area under curve greater than 91 for 32 out of the 38 different individual diagnostic classes, which is excellent. And in green, I will highlight the class, the diagnosis where the AI algorithm outperformed the cardiologist clinical interpretation. So sinus rhythm, um, ventricular tachycardia, non-specific intraventricular conduction delay, prolonged QT, were all diagnostic classes where AI outperformed the cardiologist. And when we look in red, are classes where AI underperformed the cardiologist, and you have here AFib, um, junctional rhythm, and also wolf parkinson white Also, when we scroll down in the table, you can look for chamber enlargement and overall the F1 score, which is like a surrogate for the, the AUC curve, is higher um, again for the AI algorithm, which is this column. And then you also have ischemia. So ischemia is also higher for the AI algorithm compared to the clinical interpretation of the cardiologist. And even lean misplacement here outperforms the, the, the cardiologist. So. Uh, Pretty good results when we use the gold standard of the EP panel of physicians rather than the clinical interpretation of the ECG. And this is actually uh, the most interesting slide. So like I mentioned in my introductions, AI learns from seeing tons of examples, but we don't have to hard code the rules. So what exactly is a Wolf Parkinson White, for example? And we highlight here in pink areas of the ECG signal that are used by the AI algorithm to predict each class. And for Wolf Parkinson White, you can see it's using the Delta wave, the large QRS, the short PR. This is a right ventricular hypertrophy. And you can see it's using the R grid and S and V5. Left bundle branch block, it's using the morphology and lead V1, V2, V3. PVC, it's actually using the PVC and not um, additional beats. Uh, this is interesting too. You have here the lead misplacement. We put nine electrodes and you can see it was able to make relationships between the beats across different leads in order to figure out that this is a lead misplacement with a you know probability of 91 and uh, interesting you know it's highlighting for example the positive AVR which should always raise suspicion for this diagnosis so in short this is interesting because AI learned to use the same features of the ECG signal that we as cardiologists uh, are thought in medical school or in cardiology residency to diagnose disease, but it learns so by seeing a ton of examples without under, uh, understanding the underlying physiology. So this shows that our understanding of what is a wolf parkinson one on ECG is true, and AI is using the same thing, but it learned on its own by seeing a ton of examples. So overall, we had excellent performance for 12 lead ECG interpretation by AI. Uh, when validated against the gold standard of ECG that was read by a panel of electrophysiologists, and it uses the AI algorithm uses the same a priori segments and data as humans to predict the different diagnoses. And last but not least, this is the first time I'm presenting those results um, in public. It's a project called Kathy F. I'm very excited to share those uh, results with you just to show another potential of application of AI. So this is the LV gram. You're all familiar with this modality. It mainly used to determine EF and wall motion abnormalities. It's routinely done in the cath lab in patient that did not have an ultrasound or had an ultrasound in the different center, but it is associated with an odd ratio of 2.3 of acute kidney injury. This is a paper in 2000. I think there's more data on the topic, but in general, if you perform an LV gram, you, have, you increase the likelihood that your patient is going to have 
uh, kidney injury after the procedure. So this is a coronary angiography. So normally we, we just shoot the coronaries and we look for stenosis and that's the only thing we look for. But you can see the heart moving a little bit. So we ask ourselves, can we use coronary angiography of the left coronary artery? So an image like the one on the left to predict the left ventricular ejection fraction as measured by a transthoracic echocardiogram with a biplane Simpson performed within one week of the coronary angiography. To do so, we took 3,404 patients that had matching coronary angiograms and TTEs between 2012 and December 2019. In total, they had 26,000 videos of coronary angiography. So we normally look at the left coronary artery in different views, different angles. So we took all of the videos of the left coronary artery and we built an AI classifier to classify each video into two groups. So low EF, under 40%, or, or normal to uh, mildly reduced EF of greater or equal than 40%. Uh, so this is the results. Again, this is a familiar ROC curve. In blue, you have the performance of the AI algorithm for a single video. So it's looking at the left coronary from any incidence and on, it has an area on the curve of 79.6. So a really moderate uh, to high uh, accuracy here. But when you look at all the coronary and geography videos performing a patient and you average out the predictions of the AI across all angles, you increase the area under the curve from 79.6 to 87.4, which is actually a really good prediction uh, or a, a capability for or a really high accuracy. And we can see here that uh, we observe a sensitivity of 70% and a specificity of 82% to identify LV dysfunction under 40% using coronary angiography alone. So I'm going to show to you here two angiographies, and I want you to look at the screen and um, figure out in your mind or which one of those two the patient has an EF under 40, and which one of those two the patient has an EF under uh, above 40? Is it the top one or the bottom one? Uh, so if we look at the top one, we apply the AI classifier on this video, and we figure out that the probability that the EF is under 40 was greater than 98% based on the AI interpretation, but, and the actual EF was 22.3%. In this example, uh, the AI said the probability the F is under 40 is 2%, so it's much higher probability that's above 40%, and we actually had a 55% EF despite the CTO of the right. So this is just very preliminary work, but we're able to accurately differentiate patients' ejection fraction using coronary angiography alone. Uh, we still don't know exactly what features it's using in the video to predict the ejection fraction, and this is part of the pursued research, and it also requires external validation because this was developed in a single center for now. Uh, so we're hoping to validate it here. And then ultimately, my hope is that this could reduce radiation and contrast exposure by limiting the use of LV ventriculography only in patients that have a low EF based on the coronary angiography alone. So we pivot to the final section of my presentation, which are top myths and limitations of AI. And this is really important to go over because I think there's a lot of misconceived no notions about AI. So the first one is, you know, we hear that all the time and I've heard it you know, a really high amount of times that AI is going to replace the physician. So I think AI is a tool like any other, just like statistics. I think ultimately medicine is a human enterprise. You have no AI algorithm that can imitate the human empathy or care required for proper medical practice. I think it will make medicine more patient-centric, like I mentioned initially, and more humane because it will free up time that we currently use to uh, you know, interpret tests. The other thing, myth, is that AI is smart. So we have narrow AI at the moment. There's no such thing as smart AI. Uh, it's important to understand because AI is good at a single task that it was trained to do. It's not good at creating stuff. So if I take my ECG example from before, I train the AI, we train the AI algorithm to read the ECGs and show 46 diagnoses. Well, if there's a new disease that can be diagnosed by the ECG, for example, COVID, AI is not gonna be able to figure out that this is COVID and it's not the 46 others. It will output a prediction that maps to the diagnosis classes it was trained on. And there's no such thing as AI that can, you know, learn from, um, learn from the environment or, you know, have some consciousness or that. So AI is really not smart. We can see it at a very advanced statistical analysis program. The third myth is that AI is a black box. So we often heard that as criticism saying that AI, you can't, you don't really know what it's basing its prediction on. And as physicians, we're naturally suspicious of the prediction. We're like, well, we don't understand it. So it's a black box. So I'm going to disregard a prediction. This is no longer true. We have 
algorithms now to show which parts of the image it's using to predict a particular diagnosis. And we can make sense as humans. Does it, 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 is it based on a physiological understanding? Does it make sense, the elements of the image that it's using to predict, or does it not make sense? So I think AI is much more transparent now. It's no longer a black box, as I had demonstrated in the ECG, CAT AI, or the diabetes uh, paper. And finally, people say that AI is going to make medical de decisions and diagnoses, and I think this is a half true. It won't have the final words. There are AI-approved algorithms in, by the FDA in the US. They do require physician overread, but there are AI algorithms that can make diagnoses, like I mentioned, for example, diabetic retinopathy. It's also important to remember those limitations. AI can perform a prediction on any data, even if it wasn't trained on that type of data. So if I take the ECG example from before, and I the ECG AI algorithm, and I feed to it images, it will still output ECG diagnosis. It won't be able to tell you that the data it was input differs greatly from the data it was trained on. So it's always important to be aware of the biases in the data. Uh, and ask yourself when you're facing an AI algorithm, has it been trained on data similar to the one in my center? In general, in medicine, data is very standardized. It's the same ECGs machine in the US and Canada, the same type of scans, but sometimes there are important differences in the data, such as the frames per second used to acquire a certain image that might fool AI and will not fool a human. And this will lead to biases in interpretation. Um, I also think AI needs to be properly implemented in a clinical workflow. It needs to reduce work rather than increase work for the physician. And I think this is mainly an area of research at the moment. Now, I want to briefly go over some future directions, some projects we're working on here at Ottawa Heart Institute and some other projects I've come across in my readings that I think are really exciting. So at Ottawa Heart Institute, we're trying to develop an AI called Deep Mace. So as you're aware, STEMI patients vary markedly in terms of likelihood of bleeding and ischemic complications after a primary PCI. And we currently have bleeding and ischemic risk prediction scores, but they're of limited use clinically because they require complicated variables that we don't always obtain clinically, or they're not you know, readily accessible in the electronic medical record. In parallel, we also have EMRs such as EPIC that are now widely adopted and offer promising opportunities for developing and validating new risk scores, leveraging pre-existing data that is found in the clinical notes. And then if you develop a risk score that uses EPIC notes, you could also eventually apply it directly within the EMR and show a risk score to the physician. So you basically figure out the clinical workflow integration. So for deep maze, we wanna extract all encounter notes of STEMI patients greater than 18 years old who presented with a STEMI in the last year at Ottawa Heart Institute. We wanna apply an AI algorithm to predict ischemic and bleeding risk at one year post STEMI in those patients. And then eventually we'll love to develop uh, or to deploy the risk score in EPIC. This is an example of a STEMI note that you might be familiar with. It was written by one of our fellows in cardiology. And we already applied as a test an AI algorithm here that can identify the keywords that are really important uh, to eventually go on a risk prediction our algorithm for ischemic and bleeding complications. So you can see it figure out that this is, for example, a drug named heparin, and it figure out the form of heparin, the root, and the dose, and it linked those concepts together. It was also ab uh, able to identify diagnoses, prior diagnosis. You can see here there's overlap, prior cabbage five years ago, so it means they're all you know overlapping together. So that's that's interesting. Uh, it's just a first pre-processing step. We're currently working on extracting the data and we hope to have preliminary results before the summer. I was also very lucky to uh, have as part of one of our fellows, Dr. Thierry Lozier, who's a PGY-5 here in cardiology. And he developed this uh, really interesting project, which is uh, automatic identification of cardiac implanted devices from chest x-rays. And to do so, he developed the uh, obje object detection algorithm that can highlight pacemakers in a chest x-ray. And then once you highlight a pacemaker, you can feed that in a model classification to basically identify the brand and type of pacemaker or ICD. And here is a confusion matrix, which you're familiar with by now. And uh, you can see that the majority of classes are in the diagonal, so very high performance. And this is a similar methodology that we use for CAT AI. It's a really exciting work. And eventually you can imagine this being uh, deployed into an app to help residents and physicians identify devices from x-rays alone using AI. And beyond, there are many exciting innovations in the field. And I just wanted to share a couple of work 
made by other colleagues in the artificial intelligence research world. So, you know, and you can have the reference in the, the lower right, but there's been a deep learning, so an AI algorithm for detecting AS with a high level of accuracy, area under the curve of 0.9 and above using ECG alone. So that's really exciting because we don't normally use ECG to detect AS. There has been hard track, which is an AI algorithm that was able to detect heart rate and heart rhythms using a video of your face. Uh, and that's really interesting because you could imagine, for example, in the future, you could go in a pharmacy and there's a video camera system that could screen you for AFib based on photoplasmography on from your, your video feeds. And then you could get a free consultation and you have like, you know, in the population screening of AFib using videos. There's also been um, in neurology, so this is not directly connected to cardiology, but I think it's an interesting use case. FDA has approved the first stroke detecting software. That was in 2018. So basically, they de de demonstrated that you can automatically read CT scans of the head by AI, and it will identify if there's a bleed or not. If there is a bleed, the scan gets prioritized by the radiologist, and then it gets re read in priority. But if it's normal, the neurologist can proceed without a physician overread of the scan to administer the thrombolysis. So they demonstrated that this actually reduces the door to thrombolysis. And also, this is also exciting, as of 2020, this algorithm is now reimbursed for radiologists. So radiologists can bill $40 in Medicare and Medicaid, which is the public uh, health insurance in the US, for using this software. So this is an example of AI not replacing the radiologists, but also making it more efficient and being reimbursed. There's also been a prediction of uh, coronary artery calcium score using surface 12 ECG. And this is maybe the most science fiction or you know black mirror-esque uh, application of AI I came across in my readings, but there's uh, some authors from MIT that developed a real-time breathing and heart rate monitoring during sleep by analyzing with AI the Wi-Fi signal. And their goal is to detect arrhythmias like AFib or sudden cardiac death using your Wi-Fi router at home and AI. So that's really cool, it's very promising. This is just in the pilot phase. So my take home message today is if there is signal in the data and you have a large enough data set, I think AI will find it and will generally execute those tasks on the human level performance or superhuman level performance. I think AI in the future will automate a lot of the tasks that physicians currently perform, such as diagnosis, treatment or prescriptions in the next decade. Beware, uh, and it will also enable new tools that were previously impossible, like I demonstrated uh, with the, EC, uh, the, the diabetes, for example, screening tool. Beware of the limitations. You know, it's not a solution for all issues. It won't replace physicians. It really, it's highly dependent on the data it was trained on. So if you train it on garbage data, garbage in, garbage out, like we say, and I think the cardiologist that's gonna leverage AI tools is going to be more efficient or maybe provide better care than cardiologists alone in the future. At least that's a subjective bias I have towards that. And we need to figure out how to implement this innovations in the clinical workflow. So I wanted to give a special thanks to my mentor. So Jeff Tyson, I learned a picture here. I learned uh, how to do AI in San Francisco thanks to him. He also taught me about the art of brewing kombucha, which I highly recommend to everyone. And I drank kombucha with my other mentor in San Francisco, Jeffrey Olgin, who's an electrophysiologist. And I continue to drink kombucha with Derek So here. Uh, so this is my special thanks. I also want to thank the team at Montreal Heart Institute and the other teams at Berkeley, Stanford, and at the RISE Lab who helped with those projects. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. This is my thank you slide. And you have a QR code as well if you want to get in touch, if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That was uh, exceptional. Um, I think this is the first presentation I've been to at these rounds that we actually have this degree of social media content on the last slide. So uh, <laughs> lots of ways for people to get in contact with you. That was great. And this is actually the second presentation on AI that, that we've had this academic year. Um, and so this is clearly um, an area of active research and innovation with a lot of thought provoking uh, topics. Um, there is a question uh, that was uh, sent in from the audience. So in your projects, have you observed unanticipated variables that the AI algorithms use to predict diagnoses, whether this be in angiograms or ECGs? Um, and could these variables um, potentially now be used by clinicians? I, so is, is the AI finding novel 
um, ways to interpret the data? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So as I've uh, shown in my uh, the, the research applications I've demonstrated today, we can highlight parts of the image or of the signal that are used to predict uh, a certain class. I haven't done a routine analysis, for example, looking at a thousand angiograms to classify the different features uh, that AI is using to make those predictions, but that could definitely be done in the future to learn from the AI interpretation of the images. We also found that for the ECGs, for example, it's using exactly the same physiological concepts that we use as physicians with nothing novel. So maybe we have hit the ceiling there for the, the common diagnosis, but uh, AI can definitely be used to identify the variables that are using prediction and identify novel predictors. The issue with, with this approach is that um, having having an association between a feature and the, the outcome doesn't mean it's causing the outcome. So sometimes the relationship is not linear. It's actually much more convoluted. So you can directly assume that there's causality between what it's showing and the actual prediction. But um, I, I don't have any specific example to highlight except the diabetes one, where basically we found that the dichrotic notch or heart rate is really important in classifying PPG signals into diabetes and non-diabetes. And that's something that we're not used to as physicians. But that could be done right. in the future. Right, so an area of, of ongoing uh, exploration, I guess. Yeah. Um, Dr. Golian uh, has uh, commented, um, and his, uh, his comment is, considering the large number of data sets required for modeling, how do you adjust for poor data entry into systems that are dependent at multiple levels uh, for human input, such as an EPICS um, EMR? So do you have any suggestions on how to evaluate a data set and how do you improve data entry into these EMRs, such as EPIC? Yeah, so one of the really useful um, tools in modeling AI algorithms is to um, train an AI algorithm experiment and then plot the error. So plot the false positives and the false negatives it's doing. And eventually you will find a certain pattern. So, you know, we found, for example, in the cornea angiography study that uh, the, the physician sometimes don't assign percent stenosis if the stenosis is mild to moderate and the vessel is not intervened upon, but AI was actually flagging those uh, data points and then it, it was not able to predict an actual percentage because there was no percentage in the report. So I think plotting errors is really important. The other thing is that AI is much less sensitive to outliers or erroneous data. I would say if you'll have a large enough data set that is, let's say, comprised of 80% accurate data and 20% noise or gar garbage, AI is going to be able to flag those at noise or basically it, it might make error at 20%, but we'll still learn from the 80%. It will not be bias by 20% as long as you have those as a minority. So AI compared to conventional statistics is much less influenced by, uh, you know, erroneous data. But I would say plotting the errors and, you know, iterating over and over, plot the errors, exclude them, train a new model, plot the errors, you know, fix or exclude those errors and repeat that until you have a final model. This usually takes months or years of work. Right. Okay. Um, Dr. LeMay has a question regarding um, aortic dissection, and he's wondering if you could comment on the use of AI for interpretation of um, CT chest scans uh, with this pathology. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we come across a couple of cases where we thought there was clinically aortic dissection and uh, the scanner was not confirming that. Uh, I haven't seen any work done by um, by teams, but it's possible there is about automatic interpretation of CT scans of the uh, aorta to determine aortic dissection, but that could definitely be done. I mean, you need to take scans of patients with dissection, without dissection, and build an AI classifier of the area of interest. And I, I would assume that would perform uh, reasonably well if you have a large enough data set. But I haven't come across any work on the topic, but I don't see why it's not feasible. Okay. Um, Dr. Nair in, in uh, EP has a question regarding um, wide complex tachycardia. So how do you address the challenge of comparing AI tools with gold standards for definitive diagnosis? So uh, how do you, um, how do you, for example, in EP testing report wide complex tachycardia? So how well, do you so compare AI versus, you know, EP testing, I guess this is his question. So, you know, in our ECG paper, we, we took surface ECGs 
and we use a panel of electrophysiologists that would read those ECGs and come to a consensus regarding the diagnosis. And we use that as the label or the gold standard of AI. Similarly, you could use EP testing uh, as the final label and use surface ECGs to predict EP testing results, for example, for wide complex tachycardias. So it's just a matter of labeling the data, taking patients that had EP procedures, uh, look at what the finding in the EP procedure was, and then take their surface ECGs, for example, if you want to use that as data input. And then um, instead of using the actual muse or cardiologist overread, you use the EP procedure findings as the gold standard, and you train your AI using that. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question right or if I understood the question, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, and so there's another question in um, on the EMRs. Um, is there a way that you um, would set up an EMR to ensure that um, more data can be extracted or um, that the data is, is better accessible for AI? So for example, in an EMR like Epic, are there things in it that you would change to facilitate the um, you know, uh, advancement of, of AI um, development. Yeah, I think currently Epic is mainly uh, made for billing. So there's a lot of uh, ICD codes that are really important in the US for billing and not really pertinent in Canada. Uh, I think having, you know, if you, you strip down the, um, the EMR and you only have clinical notes with a problem list, with a list of diagnosis labs, uh, and images, and you only use that as data instead of all the other encounters or you know ICD codes that might not mix and match. I think you get a better result. Uh, unfortunately, and there's been a lot of work uh, done using Epic EMR data and AI. And the general approach is they take ten years of data, and they take thousands of patients, and they feed it all to the AI. And eventually, AI is going to narrow down on the relevant terms that I just cited, and will ignore the billing stuff and the stuff that's not really pertinent for prediction. Okay, maybe um, two more questions as we come to the to the end of our time. Um, uh, first question is: review in reviewing uh, heart maps, have you identified new features to predict um, coronary artery stenosis? So uh, no, I mean it's using the vessel. <laughs> it's using the vessel, so it's it's basically using the same thing as humans, but it's performing, it's standardized. So giving a, a certain vessel and stenosis is going to output the same percentage uh, rather than two humans looking at the same vessel, same stenosis going to output a percentage that differs by on average 20 to 25 percent. Okay, um, and I'm going to actually uh, ask a question um, that's a bit more philosophical. Um, so do you have uh, sort of two parts? One, um, in this era of patient privacy, um, which is very important and where, you know, we hear a lot about that and have to do this, you know, patient privacy training, et cetera, every year. Um, do you have concerns regarding privacy issues for patients with all of these various um, uh, proposed new technologies? Uh, that's the first part of my question. And the second part is, um, do you have philosophical concerns about the potential de-skilling of trainees? So if our AI algorithms um, advance to the point that they have, you know, equivalent um, uh, accuracy as, you know, the physicians that helped develop the algorithms, um, do you worry that, you know, medical students will not develop the skill set um, that their predecessors did and they will become dependent on this technology? Great, great questions, uh, Dr. Stenning. To start with your first question regarding privacy issues, I think as a physician and researcher, uh, of course, I have uh, privacy issues regarding the data. Uh, you used to train AI algorithms. There's been specifically cases where they have proven that even if you take anonymized data sets, uh, actually insurance companies can figure out who the patient is because they have the zip code and there's only that many patients of that ethnicity living in that zip code. And then they can actually map down with a high level of accuracy who the patient is, even if you have no patient identifier. So I think we have to be really careful about the, the data uh, that, it, that it's publicly available. Right now, I would say there's two different types of data sets. You have EMR nodes, and those are generally not shared outside of the institution. 
And I think it, right now for privacy issues, that should be the case. Um, and in general, if you keep it inside the institution and you train an AI algorithm on those nodes, you don't have any issues with privacy because the AI algorithm will learn from the nodes, but then will not have a memory of the nodes per se. So you can apply it outside of the institution without re-identifying the patient it was trained on. Now the imaging data is a bit different because it's much harder to identify a patient uh, from the imaging data unless they have a really um, you know, unique history. Uh, that is seen in an image. And I've seen a lot more data sets that are publicly available made by Stanford or San Francisco UCSF, uh, such as ultrasounds or chest x-rays used to advance the field. We have to understand that AI really thrives when you have large data sets. And to really get AI that's gonna change outcomes, you need to share data across institutions. So we have to balance privacy issues with the advancement of healthcare. And I think for images, I'm much more open to sharing those. I think the notes, it has to be a bit, uh, the notes, you can't really share them, but I would say another field of research in AI now is synthetic note generation, where basically they use pre-existing notes to generate fake patient notes that are then shared. Uh, and then those can be used for training. So this is a whole area of research I haven't dived into, but you can generate fake data. It's, uh, it looks like the real data, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not representing any real patient. Um, now, I would also say the privacy issues are mainly raised by ethic boards and physicians, but when you actually survey patients, I published on the, the topic, there has been some republications, patients generally would favor the advancement of healthcare rather than their own privacy. And, uh, you know, we hadn't had issues with, a healthy heart and getting 60,000 patients to download the app and contribute data, despite the fact it was like a digital study. So they had no concerns around privacy. Now, regarding the de-escalation of trainees, um, I think they would eventually, it will, they will not learn the same skills as uh, they learn today, but they will learn new skills. And I think we can talk to, you know, uh, physicians that were trained in like you know 30 40 four years ago or retired physicians and you would see that they were learning to examine patients in a whole different way than we do today for some of the, the diseases and they also didn't have access to scans or more advanced imaging that is currently used to diagnose disease so they had to rely on skin findings for example so i think it's just going to transform to uh, you know a different medicine that's uh, you know leveraging this this readily available data and will develop new tools using this pre-existing data I don't Thank think you. they will de escalate. I think they will change. They will differentiate. Yeah. Thank you. That was that was an outstanding uh, presentation this morning and really thought provoking, as uh, demonstrated by all the conversation and uh, and questions. Um, uh, so thank you very much for presenting this morning. Really enjoyed that. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that it's Grand Rounds next week. Uh, it's the Keon lecture. Um, uh, Professor uh, Renani from uh, the uh, Israeli Heart Society will uh, be presenting on surgical and percutaneous mitral valve therapies. So thank you for joining today and have a good week. Thanks again, Robert. Outstanding. And hopefully you, continue, continued collaboration with the Heart Institute when you return to Montreal. Likewise, that's the objective. Awesome. Take good care.